You heard that? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay. We'll wait another minute or two. I see we've got 11 people so far. Moving up. One more minute. Guys, I think I'm going to start because I know that everyone's going to have a lot of questions. So we wanna make sure that we have time to do that. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Rhonda Damasio and I'm the director of the Friends of Laurel Hill and West Laurel Hill Cemeteries. And on behalf of the board and staff, we're delighted that you could join us for this virtual presentation of the Pencoid Iron Works. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Friends, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting and preserving the historical character of West Laurel Hill and Laurel Hill Cemetery. Throughout the year, we, pro we provide over 100 programs of historical tours, educational workshops, virtual programs now, in, in uh, cemetery concerts and theatrical productions. So um, please come visit our web website, which I'll put on the, the chat to see what our upcoming uh, programs are. More specifically, our, our cinema in the series is back this year, and now it's at West Laurel Hill, which is very exciting. Um, this evening, we're super fortunate to have um, Perry Hamilton from the Lower, American, uh, Lower Marion Historical Society and the Penn Group of Companies, as well as the author himself, who I'm not sure, Kevin, if you were the 
person who is the farthest away from us right now. I don't know in Texas. We may have some other people who may challenge you. Maybe there's somebody from California. Who knows? <laughs> but um, I'd like to thank them for all of their time with this, as well as Rachel Wagmuth, who is the special projects assistant, who is also on this, um, this virtual uh, panel as well. Uh, what I'm going to ask that you everybody do, if you're not talking, if you can mute yourself, if you have a question, just put it in the chat. Uh, we'll save it for the end. And as we go through the presentation, I have a couple links that I'll put up, um, you know, for your reference. And um, we'll, we'll go from there. Um, so now what I'm going to do is, let's see. First of all, let me just go to the next slide. Yes, that's me. Okay. <laughs> Our rules of Zooming. Um, I, we are recording this. It's going to record to the cloud, knock on wood. And um, when that hopefully we'll be able to share that with you. Um, the, the program is gonna last an hour and um, we'll save the end for questions and answers. And now I'm gonna turn it over to um, Nancy Goldenberg, who is the president and CEO of Laurel Hill Cemetery and West Laurel Hill Cemetery and Funeral Home. Great, great. Take it away, Nancy. <laughs> Thank you so much, Rhonda and sure. everyone for being with us this evening. You know, West Laurel Hill has really enjoyed a very long relationship with the Detroit area. When, when West Laurel Hill Cemetery opened in 1869, uh, it was one of the first cemeteries in the nation to feature burial by rail. Um, and that's where the funeral processions came to the city, from the city to the cemetery by railroad. Their destination was the Reading Railroad's Pencoit Station, which is a short distance from what was then West Laurel Hill's main entrance. The very first structures built in the cemetery were our receiving vaults. And that's where bodies were received and often, often temporarily housed while waiting for either the ground to fall or their mausoleum to be built. And these receiving vaults were placed close to that main entrance. Over the many decades that followed, the West Laurel Hill Station and later the Barmouth Station replaced the Pencoit Station as the primary point of entrance by rail to West Laurel Hill. Then in the 20th century, as cars replaced railroads, the main entrances relocated to Belmont Avenue and the Pencoit Gate was locked and what we now call the Pencoit side of the cemetery was unfortunately somewhat forgotten until about 10 years ago. This was when the cemetery began to look at its original entrance with a new lens. With the increase in recreational uses on both sides of the Schuylkill River, we opened the Pencoit Gate again and cyclists discovered the joys of West Laurel Hill. A few years ago, the road that bisects the cemetery that connects the Pencoit Gate to the Barmouth Gate was officially designated as part of the region's circuit trail network. And believe it or not, last year, we welcomed nearly 60,000 bike riders and pedestrians through the Pencoit entrance to West Laurel Hill Cemetery. With the increase in visitors to and the visibility of our Pencoit side of the cemetery, we are now looking for ways to make the cemetery more welcoming for our visitors. We are currently developing an ecological restoration plan for our Pencoid Gateway that will get rid of the invasive plant species and incorporate a beautiful new landscape. We're also looking to improve signage and visitor amenities. We are especially thrilled by the new residential, commercial, and recreational developments all around us, particularly the work of the Penn Group. We are so proud to be among the properties associated with Pencoid and just delighted to shine a light on Kevin Ryder's important book, Philadelphia's Pencoid Ironworks, Forging Along the Schuylkill River. So now I'd like to take a moment to introduce the speakers for tonight's presentation. Harry Hamilton is a volunteer historian and researcher for the Lower Marion Historical Society. He's also a very dedicated board member. Since 1949, the Historical Society's volunteers have provided educational programs to the public and thousands of students, residents, and scholars have worked with the Society's extensive resources. 
the Historical Society remains a vital, vital force in preserving the rich history of the Lower Marion community. Kevin Ryder um, was born in Pittsburgh and attended Haverford and Bryn Mawr Colleges, the University of Michigan and the University of California, Berkeley, where he received degrees in geology and geological science. His family is from the Philadelphia area and dates back to the 1680s. He is the ninth generation. Interest in his family history and the Philadelphia area was prompted by his parents, whose extensive research into their family tree even included records in Europe. His great grandfather, Walter Ryder, worked at Pencoid for nearly 50 years from 1885 to 1933 first as a mechanic, then as a supervisor, and finally as superintendent of Monday. Recording in progress. Donna Galvin is the founder of the Penn Group, Stephen Gibson, the Penn, Penn Group's in-house architect. The Penn Group, which specializes in the restoration and adaptive use of historic buildings. Uh, Donna and Stephen love the design and challenge of modernizing historic structures with best environmental practices to create healthy and dynamic spaces. They are clearly succeeding in their redevelopment of the Pencoid Ironwork site as a new regional destination with their headquarters, a new residence in hotel, restaurants, and beautiful public spaces. As our new local hangout, I hope Donna and Stephen do not get tired of seeing me. Um, so with that, um, I am going to turn things over to Perry. The floor is yours. Thank you. I just had to unmute there. Thank you, Nancy. Appreciate it. And I'm very appreciative of West Laurel Hill Cemetery for hosting this. And uh, we always appreciate the opportunity to talk good old Lower Marion history. So I'll start. <clears throat> From the dawn of civilization, in the common routines of the life of nearly all humans, change was rare and was metered out over large segments of time. For example, at the turn of the 19th century, 1800, we find that little had changed since the days of the Greco and Roman empires. For example, in 1800, farming was done mostly the same as it was done in Roman times. Bridge building and road building was for the most part, the same as Roman times. Travel was largely the same, and no one in 1800 traveled any faster than anyone in the Roman times, whether they traveled by land or water. Preparation of food was largely unchanged, except very notably for the introduction of spices from the Middle East. But other than that, preparation of food was largely unchanged. The building and trades had advanced very little over the expanse of 1800 years and private and public plumbing had changed very little. But seismic change for all humanity began to occur in the early decades of the 1800s. Now, depending where in the world you lived, the industrial revolution started to display itself probably by the 1820s. The industrial revolution with all of its direct ramifications was by far the largest single period of economic growth in the history of civilization. It was a rising tide of economic growth that floated nearly all boats. For the vast majority of Americans, whether you lived in the heart of the city or remote rural locations, there was vast improvement in nearly every facet of nearly everyone's life. For example, there was unprecedented improvement in food preparation that resulted from this period. Home heating, a serious problem for many by the 1800s, soon became much more reliable with less time and labor. The building trades improved beyond imagination. Travel for many humans became faster by a multiple and at the same time, safer. Um, Transoceanic travel became far safer, more reliable, much faster, to such an extent that transoceanic travel spawned the leisure travel industry of its own. 
Farming became more reliable, far more productive, and much more lucrative. Nighttime became a more useful period of time. The knowledge of time itself became more widespread and useful. Educational institutions flourished as never before. And perhaps most importantly, the Industrial Revolution liberated mankind from the theories of Thomas Malthus. No longer were people bound to the thinking that more people meant less for everyone. Uh, could you advance the slide, please? Looking at this specific location of this property that has been so beautifully developed by the Penn Group, this history is very well displayed and in a conceptual way preserved. Central to this property site is the former location of Writer's Ferry. In 1800, this was the only spot within two miles, either upstream or downstream on the river, where you could safely cross the Schuylkill River, and you did it by ferry owned by the Writer's family. The ferry arrangement was, for the most part, the same as ferry operations had been since Roman times. This was a quiet place that exhibited mostly the serene sounds of nature. And all of that changed, and the discovery of anthracite coal is the reason why. Now, in the archives of the Lower Marion Historical Society are records of burials of many of Lower Marion cemeteries and burial grounds. And the unfortunate truth is that many people of that time, I'm talking about the late 1700s, early 1800s, many people of that time died from starvation and from freezing. You see, by the earliest years of the 1800s, there was a severe firewood shortages in both New York and Philadelphia. The gathering of firewood in those times was a laborious and time-consuming chore, and many did without enough firewood in those years. The discovery of hard coal became the solution to this problem. Anthracite coal, or hard coal, is a very rare and valuable coal that was discovered high in the mountains above the Lehigh River Valley. It was quickly determined that the fastest and most economical way to get this coal to the neediest and most lucrative markets, that's Philadelphia and New York, was to bring it down the Schuylkill River Valley. Now, one of the earliest common carrier railroads in America was the Philadelphia and Reading Railroad, commonly called the Reading Railroad. This railroad was built primarily for the transportation of hard coal to the cities, and it was early determined that the main line of the Reading was to go right through Lower Marion on its river border. By the late 1840s, the Reading Railroad was the largest business corporation in the world, and it ran right through the property of the Roberts family of Lower Marion. Now, because of this unique source of coal and the railroad that transported it, much industry and commerce emerged along the Schuylkill River Valley. I have read that until the beginning of the Civil War, or actually the end of the Civil War, the Schuylkill River Valley produced about 70%, that's 7-0, percent of America's industrial wealth. From Phoenixville through Birdsboro and Pottstown, down to Allenwood Steel of Conshohocken, the Schuylkill River Valley proved to be a lucrative location for iron and steelworks. But along the Schuylkill River Valley in Lower Marion, the Pencoid Iron Works became known as an industry leader in quality and innovation. Uh, if you could advance the slide, please. <clears throat> By the late 1840s, the Reading Railroad was the largest business corporation in the world, and it ran right through the property of the Roberts family, originally called Pencoid. The fifth generation of the Roberts family, Algernon, his brother George, their cousin Percival, were early enthusiasts of the coming Industrial Revolution, and cousins Algernon and Percival together formed what became known as the Pencoid Ironworks. As a matter of interest, the other cousin, George, George Roberts, became president of the Pennsylvania Railroad late in the 19th century at a time when the Pennsylvania Railroad was the largest business corporation in the world. 
The story of the Iron and Steel Company of the Roberts family in Lower Marion, as told in Kevin Ryder's book, is fascinating. And I strongly recommend everybody to grab this book and read it. As the Industrial Revolution generated unprecedented wealth in America, many great architects grew to unprecedented fame and fortune by designing fabulous buildings and structure. Rare, if not unique, rare, if not unique, among these successful architects of that time was Frank Furness, or I've heard it called Frank Furness, either way. Furness deviated from classical design and designed his structures to be compatible in form with nearby industrial structures. And he did it in a way that was pleasing to the vast majority of the public. Today, in the same spirit of Frank Furness, Penn Group, the current developers of this historic industrial property have seen the beauty in American industry. They have captured the impressiveness and influence of structural steel of the industrial age, and they've incorporated it into their state-of-the-art buildings. This will be displayed in greater detail later in this presentation, and I hope you will enjoy knowing about it. But moreover, I think you will find it to be enriching and enjoyable to visit this location and witness for yourself how the remnants of this glorious bygone era have been integrated into the environment of our modern structures of the Penn Group. And I wanna thank everybody for your time and attention. Okay, well, Thank you for the, uh, putting this into context, Perry. And uh, I wanted to also thank uh, Nancy and Rhonda and Rachel for, uh, for getting us all together this evening. This is great. And uh, the only way I could be happier, I think, would be as if I was actually there with you all in person in Philadelphia. So maybe sometime uh, soon that can happen. So I, I wanted to... Um, start with this image of the uh, just a very impressive view of the ironworks from the mouth of the Wissahickon Creek. Uh, this was taken around 1910, I think, 1911. And uh, I remember uh, a conversation I had with Rachel last year, where we talked about what, what the valley, what this valley must have, uh, and this whole area must have sounded like at the peak, operational peak of the Pencoid plant, it, the machinery in the plant must have been uh, so uh, uniquely loud and um, just dominated the region. And that's captured in this quote here by uh, the historian, Pennsylvania historian Cornelius Wagand, which I, I won't read, but if you, <laughs> if you, um, if you can um, glance at it, you can see that uh, when the plant shut down in, 19, in the early 1940s, the people who lived in Germantown nearby uh, who had complained about it for decades, all of a sudden the area fell silent and they, they actually missed the sounds of the plant. <laughs> so anyway, uh, that's just something to think about as you uh, go through the history. A lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the um, history is visual, looking at images of the plant and and uh, the, the property and so forth. But if you can think about what it must have sounded like too, that's almost as impressive. So uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, as, as uh, Perry mentioned, the, the Pencoid Ironworks was founded by two cousins, Percival and Algernon in 1852. Uh, they, had, had, they were descendants of the original uh, Welsh Tract founders in the 1680s and uh, who had had a tradition of, a family tradition of farming. And with that sort of waning, these cousins uh, became interested in hardware and in industry. And with a little bit of help from their parents, they uh, procured a, a used trip hammer from a, a machine shop in Fishtown, uh, moved it up to this location and um, their first 
order was a dozen railroad axles in 1852 and, and hence the start of the company. So if you go to the next slide, they uh, very quickly established themselves as uh, producers of wrought iron. And uh, this is a lithography to, on the upper left of the slide here that, that was produced around that time frame, maybe the mid 1860s, uh, showing the cluster of buildings that had emerged uh, along the river there. Uh, they, they were able to establish uh, furnaces to make wrought iron. And the, the photograph there on the lower right shows a group of uh, puddlers, as they called them, who would uh, tend to the uh, making of the wrought iron. They would, um, it was a, it's a real artwork um, or uh, something that had to be acquired with a lot of experience. And I think you can see in the foreground of that photo, a big ball of uh, wrought iron that was typical of what you would pull out of the, of the furnaces. Uh, so they, be, they became nationally known for making railroad axles. They had an extensive testing uh, facility there that allowed them to demonstrate their compliance with uh, standards. And um, they were soon making, if you go to the next slide, uh, making bridges, wrought iron bridges and, ac and railroad axles, as I mentioned already. Uh, the bridges were um, built uh, in the Lehigh Valley Railroad and the Pennsylvania Railroad early on. Uh, they also built some um, bridges in Oklahoma in the 1859 to, uh, sorry, 1859 to 1860 timeframe. And uh, this picture shown here is one from uh, up around Bethlehem that was built in 1858. So these were um, pretty simple structures, but they were uh, very successful and, and caught on. There were, there were a number of them, probably uh, close to 20 around the country, I think, in, or around the region in that time frame. So uh, if you go to the next slide, what they soon established there was a, a rolling mill and a rolling mill, uh, which, which sort of uh, led to distinction in the production of uh, structural shapes or structural steel structural iron. Um, rolling mills are uh, designed to take a, a raw, a, a length of raw iron or steel and roll it into a shape uh, after repeated uh, passes through the, roll, the rolls. And you can see a few roll patterns there at the top of, the, of this slide that if you rolled back and forth, you would get from a sort of rough shape to a, a very uh, intricate final shape from right to left, for example. Uh, and then you see some examples of the kinds of shapes that they could roll at Pencoid. There were beams, channels, angles, and T's, and they were all used for various uh, structural, uh, uh, various structures. And at the center, the lower center there is, a, is actually a piece of uh, hot steel being rolled in one of uh, Pencoid's um, rolling mills, just for example. So th this was um, uh, something that, that made Pencoid unique. They had a lot of rolling mills. And in a few slides, I'll show you a few more of those. If you go to the next slide, please. Um, around, it was in 1876 when that rolling mill was in, that first one was installed. And that was another significant year for the ironworks. Uh, they, they had, uh, received a contract for, for the uh, Centennial Exposition to build two of the uh, large structural steel for two of the large buildings there, the main exposition hall and memorial hall. Uh, the, the main exhibition hall is shown there at the bottom uh, under construction on the left and then the final uh, completed building on the right. And so this was a very significant piece of work for them. In the same year, Percival Roberts Jr. had started working at Pencoid, and he's pictured there a little bit later than 1876. But nonetheless, uh, I wanted to show Percival Jr. there because he ultimately led many uh, innovations at, at the company, uh, continuously updating 
technology and they, they grew uh, incredibly under his uh, leadership, which ultimately led to their, um, their being merged into American Bridge and United States Steel, uh, both, both of which companies he held uh, positions because of his leadership uh, capabilities. So anyway, if you go to the, to the next slide, I wanted to, so uh, a, lot of, a lot of you local there are familiar with the, the uh, shape of the land on which Pencoid uh, was situated. It's a long, narrow strip of uh, land. And um, sometimes you'll see photographs like the one at the top of this slide that show the full range of the mill. And it, it's actually hard to get a sense for what what happened there? What were all these buildings for? What happened in each building and so forth? And so what I wanted to do is just step through those quickly and show you a little bit of what happened in each mill building. And uh, starting with the left side of that image there along the top, which is the steel mill. And um, in the steel mill, of course, they, they made steel. They had 10 open hearth furnaces and there's a cross section through one uh, typical kind of open hearth set up there at the top left. Uh, they had an, an additional 75 ton uh, tilting furnace that was specially designed by Benjamin Talbot, one of the engineers there. And that's shown in the, the lower left, which is the uh, outside of that furnace actually. It's a ladle, hydraulic ladle that would move crucibles of steel around uh, to pour them or uh, have components added and so forth. So th this was a cutting edge technology. And then the, the, the uh, final photo, the largest photo in this slide is a look down the length of the steel mill. You can see uh, workers there for scale. This was an enormous uh, building with these uh, human sized uh, crucibles of steel lining the entire length of the building. So. Uh, this was the, the steel mill. Um, it, these are fascinating photos to me. Uh, get a, you get a good sense for what happened there. And um, that's where all the products began. So if you go to the next slide, once the steel was made, it had to be shaped. And they did this in the hammer mill. Uh, the, the photo on the left there is a hammer, a steam hammer, 20 ton steam hammer that was installed in 1889. And these hammers would be used to shape the, the iron and the steel into, into uh, workable shapes like um, blooms and billets that could be rolled, used in the rolling mills. And so on the right is a photo taken a little bit later where you can see uh, right to the left of the word ingot that's written there in yellow, there is an ingot, <laughs> a steel ingot that's being heated up uh, in preparation for uh, working in one of these hammers, which would lead to a, a rolling, rolling it out into a, a longer beam or a billet for um, further down the line. So th this was um, an essential part of the, of the operation as well. And um, the next step after that is portrayed in the next slide, which were the rolling mills. And um, at the peak of their activity, Pencoid had five different rolling mills. They had a beam, beam mill, two bar mills, a blooming mill, and a puddling mill. So th those were mills that were in the puddling, uh, the puddling operation for wrought iron. And there are a few of those uh, rolling mills shown here. Um, you can see what they had uh, um, mill workers there tending to the pieces as they rolled through on these um, tables on the left. And then on the right, there's actually, it's a little bit difficult to see, but there's a triangular shape on the left side of that photo. Right in front of that, there's a long, thin, uh, white, curvy line that goes from left to right, and it heads over to those rolling mills. That's actually a piece of hot steel that's being rolled. So these these bars, uh, they would extend for, um, you know, uh, probably up to 100 feet in length as they were rolled hot through the rolling mills. 
And that's why these rolling, some of the rolling mills were really long um, working areas to allow the pieces to be uh, rolled in and out through these multiple times. So if you go to the next slide, uh, after the pieces were rolled, they had to be straightened and cut. And so these, are, these were two more uh, specialized pieces of equipment that were there in the center of the mill operations. Um, one of them was a hydraulic uh, shear shown on the right, which would um, use pressure to, sh to shear off uh, with precision uh, a bar or a rod or what have you, piece, whatever piece of work they needed to cut. And if you go to the next slide then, all these raw materials were then fed into the bridge shop and the bridge shop was full of specialized equipment for making various bridge parts. Um, I've got two examples shown here. One was a hydraulic riveting machine, which uh, you can see there's a, there's a man standing on one half of that riveting machine and the, the riveting machinery was on rails that, that could move alongside the piece of steelwork that was being um, riveted. And so they'd move up and down the length of the, of the girder or whatever part they were riveting um, and put the rivets wherever they needed to. It was a uh, pretty nifty automated, <laughs> as automated as it gets back then. And as is the case with the piece of equipment on the right, which was a multiple drill press, you could, you could uh, I think there were eight different drill bits on this particular machine. So you could drill eight different holes at the same time. And, uh, this was a world famous, literally world famous piece of equipment that was featured in engineering journals all over the world. <laughs> uh, if you go to the next slide, one very specialized bridge part that they made was uh, the eye bar. And the eye bars are, were, were made in the hydraulic forge at the upper, the most um, almost tip of the uh, plant upriver there, you can see on the right side. Uh, the eye bars are these parts. There are a couple of um, examples shown on the right, right side of this slide. Uh, diagonal lengths in bridges and also horizontal pieces. You can see those eye bars uh, that are hooked into the, the pin connections there and, and a couple of uh, bridge examples of bridges from the Pittsburgh area. Uh, but the eye bars were um, made from pressing these, uh, again, hot bars of steel or iron in a hydraulic press, like is shown in the center of this slide from top to bottom. And once, once the, um, the sort of uh, lens shape bulb uh, shape was pressed like this, then it would be cooled and drilled out for the uh, pin connection to be inserted through. And so th this was developed by a, a Norwegian engineer named Henrik Loss. Uh, this was perfected there at Henkoid, and I think it was transferred onto the various American bridge company localities around uh, the country after, after that I-bar shop uh, closed down at Pencoid. So if you go to the next, um, next slide. So finally uh, is the shipping yard. And this was uh, also at the upper end of the plant. And you can see a couple of shots here showing uh, all the products lined up and waiting to be loaded onto railway cars to take them off to various destinations. And there's one example there in the upper left, which is a, a large um, beam that was being shipped off to New York City for the Bonwit Teller department store. And that was around 1912. <laughs> so that's a, a good example of, of a destination. So uh, that sort of gives a summary of the, the, the mill from, from, uh, from left to right and what happened there. If you go to the next slide, I wanted to uh, br just mention briefly uh, some of the engineers that worked here. Um, I won't go into much detail, but there were some very significant um, engineers who were affiliated with um, Pencoid. James Christie on the left there um, was uh, instrumental in 
determining relative strengths of iron and steel and the shapes that that were most um, that were strongest, I guess you'd say, for making uh, buildings and bridges. C. C. Schneider and Paul Wolfel, Wolfel were chief engineers in this time frame, and they oversaw many um, significant projects, not only while they're with Pencoid, but before and after their association with Pencoid. And then uh, John Waddell was a bridge, a famous bridge engineer. Um, and his connection with Pencoid is he had developed a very strong, simple structure called the A truss that was built all over the country. Um, they, uh, within a kind of a narrow period, there's, a, there's actually one, only one existing uh, left in Missouri, I think. Uh, but anyway, John Waddell he had some connections with the engineers at Pencoid um, and probably was influential um, in some of their uh, designs and jobs as well. If you go to the next slide. So I wanted to just briefly show a few of the works uh, because there, there are many in Philadelphia area. Uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with the Broad Street Station. Uh, there's a beautiful picture of it here. The Broad Street Station at the time it was built was uh, the, I think the longest span um, in the world. It was uh, 315 feet, I think, uh, unsupported. So th this was a significant structure. I, I don't think that last, that record didn't last very long, but it may have lasted for five or 10 years. <laughs> uh, and um, there were other similar kinds of sheds like this that, that uh, Pencoid had designed and built. The other uh, building here is the um, the Mint U.S. Mint Building that's on uh, in, um, Indian Indian Gar Indian Garden Street, I think, if that's correct, um, in Philadelphia. That was built in 1901, and uh, all the structural steel from that building was rolled at Pencoid. And then a couple of other buildings, the UGI Building and the West End Trust Building, are examples of uh, these uh, steel cage structures that that were built where all of the internal steel forms the framework and then the, uh, the brickwork is put around that on the outside. And there's an example of the steelwork shown there from uh, the Fisher building in, in Chicago, which was a good way to, uh, to uh, a good photo to illustrate this, this kind of design. And uh, oh, thank you, Spring Garden Street. <laughs> uh, thanks for uh, one, of, one of the um, audience for pointing that out, setting me straight. Okay, the next uh, slide. Uh, so in addition to these many buildings, so I, I wanted to show buildings because the uh, um, Pencoid is so often affiliated with bridges and that it's deservedly so, but they had really an amazing number of buildings that they contributed to as well. And, and I wanted to capture that on that last slide. So here are a few local bridges. The um, so-called Mule Bridge, built of wrought iron in, in 1889, connecting uh, Lower Marion with, um, with uh, Maniunk. And then the familiar uh, Pencoid Bridge. Uh, I love this view because it shows you what that valley looked, that part of the valley looked like around 1900, showing the, the plant in the background. And there's that bridge that leads to the office building that you'll hear about in a few minutes <laughs> from Stephen. Uh, that's a, um, another one of their typical bridge types that they built uh, in 1900. And then two, two more spectacular bridge structures are shown at the bottom there. The Niagara Steel Arch Bridge was built in 1897 across the Niagara River, um, beautiful structure. And on the lower right is, the, is a bridge across the Mississippi River, which was a cantilever structure. Um, near Theb, Thebes, Thebes uh, built in 1905. And um, that's also, a, if you have interest in bridges, that's one worth checking out. It's a very impressive, uh, large structure. Okay, so the next, next slide. Um, there's not enough time to show all, all of the bridges, but here's a map showing you where, how extensively they, they were distributed across the country. Uh, so there, there were about 120 that I could find documentation for. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm still finding 
bridges, uh, I, you know, uncovering bridges that I missed in the first round of my uh, research and exploration. So uh, the list is likely much longer than the 120. Uh, the next slide, please. Just to finish off here, I wanted to uh, show a few international examples of their work. There was a, a viaduct built in Japan in 1912 that's shown in the upper left there. That stood for uh, nearly 100 years and has since been replaced by a concrete structure. But um, that structure, part of the structure you see there has been preserved in a museum. If you visit this bridge site here on the north coast of Honshu, you can see uh, a dedication to the bridge that preceded the new bridge, and uh, rep, which is a reverence for its um, uh, ha handiwork. <laughs> Pretty nice thing to do for them to do. Uh, on the upper right, you, there's, you can see a, a photo from 1898. This was the famous Atbara River Bridge that's uh, in what is, what is now Sudan. This was a bridge that Pencoid won, for which the uh, Pencoid won the contract by beating out, I think, three or four English companies. Um, it was the English government who put out the contract to have this bridge built. And the American company won the contract. This was a very controversial, <laughs> uh, but it, it illustrated how quickly and how inexpensively Pencoid could put together a design like this and implement it halfway across the world. Uh, pretty impressive. They did that on several occasions. And the last example is in the Chihuahua Pacific Railroad there in the bottom. On the left is a, is a photograph taken at the time in 1899. And then on the right is a more recent photograph. Uh, this structure is still being used by trains, uh, you know, very impressive, 100, over 100 years later. So if you go to the next slide, I just want to finish by saying, um, I hope that I've captured uh, the breadth of what they accomplished there at the, at the mill. Um, my connection to Pencoid, is, as was mentioned earlier, was my uh, great grandfather, Walter, who's uh, circled here in yellow. He, he started in the machine shop in 1883. Uh, he had become superintendent of motor, motive power by his retirement in 1933. Um, I wanted to learn more about what he did. And I, I found it difficult to find information. I was finding little bits and pieces here and there. And finally, after a few years, I realized this is an incredible story. I can't believe nobody's told this story yet. So I decided to put it together in a book and um, book format, and here we are. So I hope uh, you find the book <laughs> interesting and the topic and uh, uh, looking forward to questions. And I think with this, I'm, I'll make one more segue here. This, <laughs> this photograph was taken in front of the Pencoid office building and it's the same building that uh, the Penn Real Estate Group has refurbished so beautifully. And so I would like uh, with that to turn it over to Stephen. He can tell you more. <laughs> Greetings, everybody. Uh, I'd first like to thank uh, Nancy, uh, Rhonda, and Rachel for putting this together. And of course, uh, thank uh, Kevin and Perry for setting them up, uh, setting this up and everybody for being so complimentary of our work. It's, uh, it's uh, hopefully we, we can uh, impress everybody who comes down to the site. Uh, I'd like to circle back a little bit to what Perry talked about. And uh, in terms of land use and land development during the Industrial Revolution, how, how uh, much of the work happened along the riverfront, uh, specifically because it was a source for uh, water, and then also, of course, for transportation. Uh, being uh, nestled uh, between the railroad and the river. Uh, this is sort of a long, uh, a little bit of an awkward site uh, to, if you're trying to lay out industrial development. Uh, and that explains why the site was uh, a mile long when they were done. Uh, uh, they, there was uh, developments all up and down the riverbank. 
Uh, one of the things that enabled their development on the river, uh, you can't see it right here, but directly below where I was, where I'm standing here is a river wall that stands uh, 15 to 20 feet tall, gigantic boulders uh, that were put in place in the uh, late 1850s in reaction to a massive flood that occurred uh, in 1849 uh, that protected the site and played a significant role in how we were able to develop right up to the riverfront and take advantage of the riverfront views. Uh, another piece that's uh, really interesting is also directly below in this view is uh, a, a towpath and the towpath in addition to the barges uh, you know or I guess augmented by the barges that were running up and down the river uh, the towpath uh, allowed connections to all the canal systems of Pennsylvania so um, really be, having those dual connections of the towpath and the barges uh, down to Center City and then the railroad uh, really positioned the site very well um, uh, next slide please this next slide that you can see on the upper left, I'm using the same version, the uh, uh, same image that are similar to what uh, Kevin showed, which is the, uh, all of the activity that was happening on the river, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and this towpath is visible there. Uh, and then in the right, uh, this is decades after the ironworks had closed, uh, uh, formal operations there. They closed in 33, I believe, 34, and then uh, reopened for World War II. But what this image really shows is uh, it's in the 50s uh, and things were transforming uh, in the foreground at the bottom of the image. You can see they're starting to build uh, the bridges for uh, the uh, school coach expressway. Uh, and then uh, down looking at the riverfront, you can see most of the development along the riverfront was sort of turning its back on the river. The Schuylkill River at that time was uh, notorious for being fairly polluted uh, and really not something that people wanted to be near. Uh, and so for many decades, that's how uh, it was perceived. Uh, if you could go to the next slide. Uh, so now I'm taking us all the way up to the year 2000. Uh, and this, is, this image is not exactly the year 2000, but uh, maybe a little bit after. But uh, in the foreground, you can see uh, the building at the bottom of the image is the office that we're in. Uh, now it's our headquarters. It's also the head, it was the headquarters of the Pencord Ironworks, immediately adjacent to the Pencord Bridge. In this image, you can see it's still rusty before it had been uh, renovated by our neighbors. And then immediately in front of our office is, was this massive uh, 60,000 square foot warehouse, uh, which really presented a development challenge uh, for, the, for the project. Uh, I'm skipping ahead a little bit here. Uh, Donna Galvin, who's on the line here, uh, one of the founders of Penn Group, uh, had this image of developing this site uh, when it was in approximately this state, uh, walking her children and her dog down along the site. She lived up in uh, Ballard Kinwood. And I think few at that time would have imagined this would have been a site that you would want to develop. Uh, and uh, But it was a 10 acre purchase starting from our office and extending back to AFC uh, Fitness Center in the background, which is one of our tenants. This is uh, 10 acres along the riverfront. Uh, the next slide. Uh, in 1997, the upper left-hand image, that, that was the, uh, the headquarters building. It was caught on fire. Uh, so, uh, and it had been boarded up and was pretty much abandoned by the time that Penn Group was purchasing the site and the previous landowner offered to tear it down uh, as part of the deal. Uh, but uh, uh, Donna and Sean uh, uh, insisted on seeing the inside of the building. Uh, and they had, again, had a vision for renovating the building and over the course of six painstaking years, uh, renovated it and re brought it back to, a, to its glory. It's a really a wonderful place to work. So lucky to work there uh, and it's, uh, uh, what was a, a awardee of a HARB award, which is the Historic Architectural Review Board, of Lower Marion Township. And then also at that same time, uh, again, advancing the vision for what this site could be, uh, a symbolic section of the trail was constructed between the building and uh, the river and, uh, and where the bridge was. 
uh, but I, again, probably before people could imagine it. The next slide, please. Next slide, please. Oops, uh, uh, to one before this. Oh, I seem to be missing a slide. Okay, this is fine. Uh, so uh, using the same image that Kevin had, uh, this I've highlighted uh, the two buildings that are uh, significantly at play in our new development. Uh, the red being the headquarters of the ironworks, and uh, now is our offices. And then the three bays of the crane bay, the warehouse, uh, pictured in yellow, uh, nestled in, um, among this huge maze of other buildings in the complex on the site. Uh, so from that, you can go to the next slide. You can see that the uh, warehouse is, was right outside our front door and really obstructed uh, and uh, how one would imagine how to develop the site. Uh, but here again on the right, we're starting to imagine what a trail could be, even though it's totally overgrown. We really wanted to start to see the connection. One of the things we first observed was when you're standing on the side of the building, you couldn't hear the expressway anymore as well. So it really connected you closer to the river. Uh, the next slide. Uh, and then in, inside the existing buildings remaining on campus, there were still uh, steel operations occurring. Uh, there was a rebar shop in the building on the right. Uh, and what we saw was the immense uh, majesty of these spaces that really were, there weren't rooms, they were more like giant urban spaces. And so we tried to figure out how we could capture that and utilize that in the development and pay tribute to the construction there uh, while, you know, continuing to develop the site, uh, you know, with spaces in and around it. Uh, in the, on the right hand side, you can see there's this X and this tree that was supporting these massive trusses uh, for the crane bay. You'll see that show up in a later image. I just want to point it out. But right here, it's just in the middle of this giant warehouse. Okay, the next image, please. Uh, this is uh, trying to manipulate the steel. I think you know, with everything that we encountered on the site, uh, above and below the ground, uh, things were bigger and heavier and more massive than we had anticipated. Uh, in this case, the two cranes are struggling to pull out a piece of this uh, truss so that we could make way for the building. Uh, all across the site, everywhere we dug, we found remnants of old tunnels and steam pipes. And uh, so we we were definitely required uh, a little bit of bravery on our part and bravery on the part of the contractors because they were they're sometimes overmatched by what they were encountering. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, and as we went along, we everything that we came across, uh, especially the steel, it had a I like to joke it had a magnetic attraction to the dumpster because it all had salvage value. But for Donna and I, we were trying to preserve as much as we could and try to imagine ways that we could utilize them and incorporate them into the new structures. Uh, so on the top right are pieces of the giant trusses. On the left, we have girders uh, from our old pump house. And on the right, corrugated steel siding, which we cut off of the, the old warehouse, set aside with the anticipation that we would use it as the skin of the new hotel. Actually, not 100% sure how we were gonna do it, but we, we, we knew we'd be able to figure it out. Uh, the next slide, please. And so here's an example of how we deployed it. Uh, we love the natural aspect of it. Some people still ask, is it, a, uh, you know, is that how you intend to leave it? And that's absolutely how we intend to leave it. We're, we really love that it brings an extra dimension to the surface. And then we tried to augment that with other corrugated steel to, uh, you know, offset it and then porcelain to, you know, give a refined feeling to it because it is, after all, a hotel that we're inviting everybody in, indoors. Uh, next slide, please. And then here you can see our building in the distance, uh, creating almost like a public square. Uh, and then the, the former trust is creating a gateway for the trail to can you continue along the uh, river's edge. On the lower left, you can see the girders that we used as a bridge over our rain garden and then connecting back to the patio of the hotel. Uh, and those, uh, that bridge, which we had not anticipated, um, it will be used for folks who have weddings, outdoor weddings. They'd like to have the brides walk across this bridge 
uh, and uh, connect into the uh, public plaza. I see I'm going over time, so I'll try to speed it up a little bit. Next slide, please. Okay, yeah, we can stop for questions here if you want. Next slide. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to put in the chat? Okay. How about you guys? Do you have any questions of each other? <laughs> No, I, I, I love seeing Kevin's presentation again. I learned more and definitely from Perry. I appreciated your presentation. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening. And um, as I put up in the chat, you can visit uh, our website, the laurelhillcemetery.org to buy a signed copy of Kevin's book. Thank you, Kevin. And um, thank you so much for everything that you you all did this evening to make this such a wonderful presentation. And I really liked Kevin, your span on um, the mills to give oh. some context uh, to, to clearly how big everything really was and how it all fit together. So thank you. Yeah, oh, thanks for, thanks for mentioning that. Yeah, I, it's, a hard, it's a hard to portray that the scale of the operation there and then also uh, to really get a, good understanding of what happened in, in every building. So, yeah. <laughs> and then every picture of the mill you see over the years um, looks different, slightly different because the mill changed so rapidly. They would, they, would dis, uh, they would demolish buildings and build a new one that had better capabilities five years later. You know, it's just um, amazing how it changed and kept up with um, demand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Rhonda, oh. it looks like we did have a, a question oh. come through the chat. Okay. Let's see. I think um, I can answer that. Sure. It's a, the question is asking, can you tell us about the reopening of the bridge? Uh, so the Pencoy Bridge uh, is privately owned by the folks who are uh, operating the Royal Athena residence. Uh, so I can tell you that when, as soon as they finished renovating it, and the, uh, the public trail opened up, we started to see commuters coming across the bridge, which was great because uh, we weren't used to having neighbors uh, uh, coming across our land. Uh, and then the, um, uh, right now, uh, it is only pr private access for the folks who have key fobs from that building, uh, but we're hoping that someday uh, uh, the developer will change their mind and make it more of a public access bridge, which is, I think everybody would appreciate that. I, know, I learned that not that long ago, it was publicly open, uh, but I think at that time it was a little lo less safe to go across it. Someone had a question. Um, is there a plan to connect up the site better with West Laurel Hill? Um, I, I, I can try and take that. Um, I know there have been discussions um, with Lower Marion Township um, currently, there is no sidewalk on, on either side of Riders Ferry Road, um, so it is quite dangerous, um, but um, um, uh, I, it's, it, it's been a while since I have checked in with the township. Uh, I don't know if they plan on constructing any um, specific bike lanes because it is pretty narrow there. Stephen, you may um, know a little bit more, Donna. Uh, we know it's been talked about, but we don't know of any specific plans. So we did our best to try and uh, create a, a safe an intersection as possible uh, with the hopes that it would be connected to some, a better pedestrian route there. And someone said, thank and, you, uh, everyone. <laughs> Great seeing the Pencoid site and neighborhood layout 100 plus years ago. <laughs> yes. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> thank you so much, Rhonda and, and Rachel and everybody for participating. Thank you so much, everyone. Did you want to say thank something, you. Perry? Okay. <laughs> yeah, I have a, 
I have a quick question. Is there ever a possibility that there could be commuter rail service for that property to Center City? I know it's a freight train, uh, really, it's a freight rail, but I'm wondering. I, yeah, interesting, I uh, think, interesting question. I think uh, freight, uh, from our experience, uh, people who run freight rail are, that's all they wanna do. And yeah. that's, they're, they're single-minded that way. So unless for some reason that rail line were to be discontinued for freight rail use, which I know some people have argued for because it's sort of unsafe the way it cuts right through the middle of center city uh, until something like that happens, it's unlikely. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank All you right. so much. Thank you. Take care. Appreciate it. Thank you very okay. much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.